launch of our maiden voyage. Thank you for joining us. If you're on the internet, hello, welcome. Um, I really felt like we needed to have a show to celebrate the women that are shaping our culture today. Um, and I really just had a dream to bring together filmmakers and entrepreneurs and inventors and shine a light on the work that they're doing um, at a time that, you know, we're talking about women. And, uh, and not just the Me Too movement, but the We're Here movement. Um, and Dell have been such fantastic partners thus far. I want to thank Dell. Um, their initiatives are so in line with the uh, spirit of this show uh, as well. They have technology for creators that really surpasses pretty much anything out there. So they're really perfect partners for us. Um, and without further ado, I want to call up uh, my first guest, who um, Lynn Shelton has been a friend of mine for years, um, a fantastic filmmaker, and Megan Griffiths, who I just met. But they both have uh, films that are premiering here, uh, just premiered here at South by Southwest 2018. And they're both absolutely phenomenal films. Uh, Lynn's film is called Outside In. It's her seventh feature. Um, we met when she premiered Hump Day uh, in 2009. She has won two Spirit Awards uh, and has played her films at festivals, every festival you can think of, from Cannes to TIFF and, and so on. And so we're very honored to have her. And Megan Griffith's sixth feature, Sadie, uh, just premiered here and just blew my mind. The synopsis actually just scrapes the surface of how deep that film goes. Both films so deep, uh, deeply about the fabric of our lives and what motivates us. Please come on up. Thank you. Hi, dear. Thanks, Andy. Thanks for having us. Oh my gosh, I'm so so happy to kick off. We talk with both of you. That was um, an amazing intro. I know you're killing it. <laughs> 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 no cue cards. So far, or so good. So, okay, it's all downhill from here. Let me pick up my notes. All right. So, um, so Lynn, I just want to talk about Outside In for a second. Um, what motivated you? You you co-wrote the film with Jay Duplass, and uh, I guess he's the honor. I've used on the front page of the Chronicle as what? <laughs> the MVP. The MVP of South by MVP Southwest this South year. By. Yes, exactly. Uh, Prince and of Austin. Yeah, and you've also, you've actually directed Room 104, which is a series, so you both collaborated. But, but Lynn, I mean, what an intense film. I mean, from Hump Day to this, it's just so, and there's a bunch of films in between. Laggies, you guys need to look her up if you don't know who Lynn Shelton is. But, uh, Everybody knows who Lynn is. <laughs> right. But, I mean, it, well, you need to see all seven films. But, um, yeah. <laughs> but it's a very serious film about a, a man getting out of prison after 20 years for being in the wrong place at the wrong time. But then it's about so much more. It's really about love, sort of across barriers, and f people finding themselves. And tell me, tell me how this all came about. Um, a lot of my films, I actually start with, I'm kind of an actor geek. First of all, I just want everybody to know that I've turned into a Hollywood douchebag, which is why I'm wearing these sunglasses. Um, I wish it was that interesting. I actually just have a thing with my eye. I just had to address that, because um, it feels weird. But uh, yeah, I love actors so much, and I become kind of obsessive about them, and I often will um, use them as the seed for an idea of a movie. They're sort of my core inspiration. So that's happened to me several times. In fact, Hump Day started with Jay's brother, Mark, me wanting to work with him as an actor. And I came up with this whole scenario and pitched it to him very early on um, as an idea. And then we, you know, I developed it from there. Um, Jay, it was the same thing. I came to him with this very nascent scenario of a guy who had just gotten out of prison after being in for 20 years and the person who really connected him to the outside world that entire time and then ended up helping him get out was his high school English teacher who was played by Edie Falco and um, uh, didn't, but at the time I was just, I just asked him if he would be interested in this scenario and exploring that idea with me. Um, and he said yes, just based on that very, very brief synopsis sort of starting point and was so involved early on uh, right from the start in the process, um, giving me a lot of feedback and I was sharing with him as I was developing the treatment and then finally uh, we just started passing the script back and forth and co-writing it together. Was there something about him? We're gonna take a look at the trailer in a couple seconds, but was there something about Jay that made you feel like yeah, um, I'd been prison. friends with him th as a filmmaking peer, you know, um, be through his brother I met him years ago and just fell in love with him immediately. Just as a human, he's very sort of, he feel, he's like one of those sort of radiant, very soulful <laughs> 
guys. I don't know. He was always so sweet to me and so supportive and just I felt so bonded to him immediately. And then he started acting. He wasn't acting before. And all of a sudden he started acting and I saw him on Transparent. It was just blown away. And I immediately wrote him and said, I will be lightly stalking you until we make a movie together. <laughs> I have to work with you as an actor. And he was like, great, you know, and then it took a couple years for me to come up with this idea. But luckily, he like immediately said yes. So I was lucky. One thing that um, I, I the reason I called both of these women up together, um, and, and I'm calling this panel Seattle Storytellers is that you both are from the Northwest and reside there. Um, which I always think, I'm always like, gosh, how can you live outside of LA? It's so great, or New York. But you, you tell these stories that are just really uh, about people that we don't usually see pictured, I guess. Um, and, and you spend time with those people, and you dig into the actual inner workings of like what it is to, it, for example, Edie Falco, well, uh, gosh, I'm giving the whole thing away. Why don't we watch the trailer? Okay, and then, sure. Okay, and then we'll talk about it. We're a free man in America. Look at this. His first beer in 20 years. Okay. Hey everybody, Chris's high school teacher is here. If it wasn't for you, Chris would still be in jail. Holy moly. <laughs> You're real. <laughs> You're going to come over and you can get to know Hildy and Tom. He's here. Congrats on your release. Maybe now I can get my wife back. A lot of guys get out and think they're free, but you're not free yet. Not by a long shot. Okay. Can you go up here to file? Mm. So what is the most different? Smartphones, whatever everyone's <laughs> obsessed with. What was it like? How'd you get through it? Your mom is what got me through it. Where were you? I was with Chris. I'd rather you not bring your charity work home. Come on, put it on. Get out of here. <laughs> I just want a simple life. Come home every day to somebody that I love and be good to them. writer, director, producer, and an editor, right? Yes, indeed. That, that qualifies you as an auteur. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, what, is the, what is the part that, that you would tell, tell us about what it, what it is to direct what you've written and then edit what you've directed? Because they say there's three different, there's the film you write, the yeah. film you shoot, and the film you edit. Well, and to be, you know, not to take credit away from the editors I've worked with, I have, I've edited three of my films, is that true? Um, my first, my second, and Touchy Feely, I went back in um, and put my hands on the keyboard. But I've also worked with amazing Nat Sanders, who edited Moonlight, um, uh, did Your Sister, Sister Humpty, and Your Sister, Sister, and Laggies. And I just worked with this amazing uh, editor named Celia Beasley, who... Megan also knows as well because she edited Sadie as well. And she's become this rock star editor in the Seattle film scene. She's amazing. Um, but I did start as an editor. So before I was directing, I was an editor. And so I'm not one of those directors, and I think you're probably similar. I'm not one of those directors who just kind of leaves the edit room and says, gives notes and comes back. And like, you know, because I do know directors who do that. And I can't imagine doing that. It's always like a two headed monster in there. We're in there together in the trenches. Um, but yeah, to me, that's kind of where it really all happens. Like I was just texting Celia, my editor this morning and saying, you know, that's where the final script really is written. And for me writing, I'm not one of those writers who would ever sell a screenplay. Like I, don't, I do not like just, you know, 
holing up in a room and writing for hours and hours and hours and and coming up with a drum tight script. For me, it's very mutable. It's it's only something I only write something that I'm going to be directing because it's going to keep evolving. It'll evolve on set and certainly in the edit room um, afterwards. Uh, so yeah, I would say that. I only write in order to direct something, and I love being on set. I love working with actors, but but it's kind of it's really a close tie with how much I love editing. I really love editing. Do you rehearse? Uh, not really. I spend a lot. I love to spend a lot of time with actors, giving them the chance to know each other, get to know each other, and get to know me as much pos as much time as possible. And sometimes that's just hanging out. You know, it's just like making dinner for them, or you know, going out to dinner together. Um, and uh, it's, for me, the most important thing is to create an emotionally safe space on set so that everybody feels like they can take the risk of, uh, of creativity, you know, of being able to really be vulnerable. And, and it's really the same for the crew as well, but especially for the actors who are making it, the good ones make it look so easy, but I always say everybody is working their ass off on set, but nobody has a harder job than the actors. And they, you'd never guess, sometimes you forget because they make it look so easy, but it's really, really hard to just be open that way with all these people around them in this weird artificial environment. And so, yeah, trying to create that emotionally safe space and trust. I mean, there's never, never a time in your film where I'm thinking that you're making a film. You know, that's the, that's the greatest compliment I can give you is just, you know, you're, there's such an age gap and there's a marriage and there's this love story that's impossible. Um, and Jay does a fantastic, fantastic, so does Edie. Um, but that's you, you know, that's you creating that safe space. And I think for both of you, you both had a teenage girl character, um, which I, yes. I, I made me think of Lady Bird and Greta Gerwig um, and drawing sort of on your own experience. Tell me about that. Uh, because she, she's a big character, actually, and then you have just a breakout performance, and you're oh my god about to take a Sophia look at Sophia is incredible. But I, yeah, I did. I, I'm so glad you brought up the character of Hildy, who is Edie Falco's daughter, who ends up forming another kind of unorthodox, you know, shouldn't be happening on paper. It's like you shouldn't; these people shouldn't be connecting. But there really is a soul connection between her and Jay's character, and. I just have to say, I cannot say enough about Caitlin Deaver. So Caitlin, I met her, she was, she played Chloe Grace Moretz's best friend, her character's best friend in uh, my film, last film, Laggies. And I knew I wanted to work with her again, and again, and again, and again. She's just amazing, she's the real deal. And so she, I, you know, the minute I got a yes from Jay, I immediately called her. So she was the next person that I knew I had to work with. Um, and she's incredible in this film, even though it's a slightly more of a supporting role, but yeah, amazing. And yeah, I really was interested in exploring that that age and that um, still trying to figure your way out. I mean, everybody is throughout the movie, no matter what age they are, <laughs> they're trying to become themselves, their true selves, you know. Um, but I guess that keeps changing. But the first phase of that, I feel like, is in that age, you know, that that teenage era. And I mean, in your film, everyone is everyone's doing that except dad, basically. Yeah. He's, right? a little, he's a little stuck. Yeah. So maybe the, maybe the moral of the story is just keep doing that. Keep doing that. Um, and and tell, us about, tell us about your lead. I'm going to forget her name. Schloss. Sophia. Sophia Mitri Schloss. Wow. Yeah. She's incredible. She uh, she's, was in a film at South by Southwest last year called Lane 1974, where she was Lane. So now she's in Sadie, where she's Sadie. Uh, so I, I joke with her that she's like only now set up to do films where she plays the titular character. Um, but she's incredible. She's just like sort of has this uh, older than her years maturity and intelligence and uh, and confidence. I mean, she's carried two features at this point, and she's just 15 years old. So uh, yeah, she was. She feels like an incredible discovery, but also. Uh, I kind of was very confident handing her the role after seeing what she did in Lane, 1974. I want to take a look. Yeah. Don't you? Let's, look to, let's take a look at Sadie. Hey, Dad. Not much to report. The news said we were scaling back troops. Do you think you'll be able to come home for good soon? I miss you a lot, Sadie. I don't think you owe that man another day much less another year, okay? You put your whole life on hold. You wanna walk me home? Why don't you 
like Cyrus. I think he's nice. Nice people don't break up families. Do you want to tell me what's going on with you, Sadie? Kids, Francis. Nobody cares what we do. Show your colors. Show your colors. Show your colors. I love I love when a film, and for me it's true as a filmmaker as well, I try to have it feel like what it is and really be visceral in that way. And I really loved just even the score there. I mean, just the song and just the, the way, you know, you're picturing these people who live in sort of permanent trailers mm -hmm. um, and, and uh, an echelon of society where it's hard to break out of that. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, your main character, uh, this, well, is Sadie, but her mom, her mom, who was played by, remind me again? Melanie Linsky. She's incredible. Agree. <laughs> <laughs> she, she's trying to find love. Uh, it's more complicated than just Sadie's father leaving. Tell us about the story and how you came to this story. Um, yeah, so the, the dad is absent in this story, and um, Sadie idolizes her father. He's, mil he's in the military. He's, he's sort of redeploying and um, staying away from their family and promising to come back and not coming back. So she's sort of heartbroken and wanting her family to kind of re come back to its original form. Um, and her mom, meanwhile, has just decided that it's time to move on. She's been prioritizing Sadie and Sadie's comfort for a long time. And then this new uh, guy comes along and she decides she's going to give herself a chance at happiness, but that doesn't, that Sadie is un, unhappy with that and, and decides to sort of intervene in that relationship sort of at, by whatever means necessary. And her model for problem solving is sort of watching her dad and this military, this violent, you know, way of solving problems. And then the world around us that we all live in uh, is also, you know, we, there's, there's a lot of examples of of solving problems with violence that we're giving our children right now. And so the movie was, a, is, it was intended to kind of contribute to that conversation about um, kids and violence and how we are teaching uh, our children right now and how we, what their problem solving skills are. Yeah, there's a lot of pain. For those of you who just came in um, talking with Lynn Shelton, and uh, Megan Griffith, and uh, they both premiered movies here, Outside In, and Sadie. And, um, and we're, let's talk about pain for a second. There's a lot of pain in your film. Everybody is, everybody is trying to process through, you know, if, if your film is more about people finding each other, your film is really about, I mean, in fact, you have someone who's addicted to opioids in the film, and it really touches on the opioid crisis mm -hmm. as well. And she's a nurse, and right, yeah. the love that she's trying to find the lover she's trying to connect with is numbing himself. Exactly, yeah. He's at a point of his life where he's lost a lot of hope. He had a, a sort of a promising career and everything, and then he injured his back, and, it's, and he's sort of in this place where he's depressed and is self-medicating with uh, painkillers, and, um, and that's when they meet each other, and she kind of gives him, offers him a little glimpse of a hopeful future, so he wants to sort of get over it, and... Uh, uh, and she's, she sees something in him and wants to help that. And, but yeah, there's a lot of people who are sort of living with pain uh, and medicating or like trying to help themselves in various ways. Yeah. And uh, did you pull on anything personal? I mean, you always have to, I suppose. Mm -hmm. But is there, um, I mean, what was the impetus for this? Um, you know, it's funny to think about that because I wrote the script in 2009 and then spent a long time trying to get it made and um, in you know, the, the thematic, overarching thematic thing about violence and, and kids uh, was what kickstarted it, but then it becomes this very sort of organic process of creating this world and these characters and who populates it and what are, what are their dimensions. And I don't remember wh where that came in, like um, where, where the, the, you know, the opi opioid crisis become a much 
bigger sort of news story in the you know, whatever, eight, nine years since then. Um, so it's, uh, it just feels like it was, it was something that just felt appropriate for that character. And, okay, wait, yeah. so you wrote this how long ago? You've been developing this for a decade? 2009, yeah. Right on. That doesn't make <laughs> me feel as weird. <laughs> so <laughs> all many my films long are like stories. so, yeah. yeah. Not all of them, but a lot. I mean, my, my new scripted film, Maplethorpe, is of 12 years. Oh. Congratulations. That's, yeah, that's okay. great. I cannot wait to see it. Um, I'm so excited. Nice to be able to say that when it's uh, underway or done, that it took that long as opposed to being in the middle well, of that so 12 years. There's so many bumps in the road that you don't realize are going to, there's no way to even predict. And um, Well, and people forget that you hear that and you think that's all they did for 12 years, but of course there was all kinds of other a stuff happening. A, a you bunch know, of other things. Occurred. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We weren't just twiddling our thumbs for that it's long. It's great but making it's documentaries <laughs> too, though, because you can jump out and go make them yeah, a lot exactly. easier um, than these scripted films. And how do you get the financing for such sensitive dramas? That was actually on my list of questions. Yeah, I mean, I was really fortunate in this particular case where uh, there we had a single, a sole financier, a female financier in Seattle, uh, who uh, just saw the value of the script. She has a young daughter. She understood what we were trying to do from like a larger thematic point of view. She really liked my work, and she just kind of uh, wrote the check. I mean, it took a long time to get to the point where she did, where she. So a single forward, financier. But, yeah. Okay. I mean, she's our executive producer, Eliza Sheldon. <laughs> yeah, and I was really lucky, too, that um, in the next breath, after Jay said, yes, I would love to act in this movie, he said, can me and my brother and our producing partner, Mel Eslin, produce it for you, for, you know, produce the film? And that was an easy yes, because they get films made. <laughs> right. And, uh, and it was, yeah, it was exactly the kind of size and budget level I wanted to work at. And, it, yeah, so it was, I was really lucky. But, what, you know, that being okay said, to it's ask? Like, do, budget? Um, it was it was under a million, but I'm not exactly sure what it was. Honestly, you'd have to ask the producers. Beautifully um, shot. Oh, thank you, yeah. thank you. Both I loved you. Nate Miller. Is somebody that we've both worked with, but um, he's a wonderful, really incredible cinematographer. But I wanted to say that it is a little bit easier. Like you were mentioning that your funder really believed in your work, in your past work, and having a little body of work behind us. Um, so people know we have a, we have calling cards, you know. We know, and those very very first films, we really we it was a lot of just blood, sweat, tears, you know, begging, borrowing, um, and getting people to um, gather around and you know good karma, building up good karma so that people would be willing to come and help us make our movies. And it was, you know, and then that really helps a lot because later on people are like, yeah, we like what you do. Here's money to make another movie. And it's amazing too. I mean, it's not always the case that someone who has a big uh, bank account who could write this kind of check also is um, is that sort of sensitive to the material and uh, and like what you're trying to do with this with the film. And so I felt really. I, I was just really grateful for that. Like, it wasn't just about, like, okay, here's the check, and now how am I going to recoup? And it's an investment, like I'm investing in a building or something. It's like I'm investing in a person and a story and getting this out into the world and making sort of yeah, they're real raising partners. awareness. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's great. And I think you took it to the Sundance Labs, right? Yeah, my producer, Lacey Levitt, went to the Sundance Producers Lab with it in 2011. Oh, okay, so not the Director's Lab. <laughs> I actually took Maple Throat through the Director's Lab. It was incredibly... Yeah. Just to, I hadn't gone to film school, so it was just mentorship that's unmatchable. Yeah, it's really... Um, all right, well, in terms of being women who are start making films, what do you think... What is the... It's something like... 11, we hear 11%, we hear 4%, we hear... I think the DGA is 7% women. So, wow. yeah, what... <laughs> really? I mean, it's been that's somewhat crazy. discussed, but... Um, yeah. I mean, I have to say, there, I, I, the last time the DGA did a, their analysis of um, gender and diversity, you know, um, the, I was impressed by the television leap. There was a big leap in the amount of, um, of hires, new hires especially, um, including this gal right here. You got you just, right? This last year was your first time getting to work in television. Crazy. A year and a half now, yeah. A year and a half now. Okay. I, I yeah. didn't mention that you, yeah, you've done everything from Mad Men to, you know, Masters of None, and I you have. just did Room 104. So. But I was lucky enough, back in 2010, I started working in television, 
and I was I was often the only woman on the roster of a of a list of directors. And and then the last couple of years, it seems like that's really changed. So that it's either the majority or at least half. You know, gender parity and a lot of and I realize some it's probably shows. the shows yeah. exactly that I'm working on. But still, just having that be a like I just worked on the show AP Bio, that's a new NBC sitcom, and I was talking to the creator um, who's become a really good friend, Mike O'Brien, and said, "How did you? We didn't know each other. How did you?" hire me. How did I get hired? And he said, well, we knew we wanted gender parity, you know, we knew we wanted half directors that were women. He's just like, it was a normal thing. I mean, that just, I was, it was like, you realize how awesome it, that is that you just said that. And you're a guy, like, you're not even, you know, you're the showrunner and you're a man. And it, it really, um, it, it, I feel like it's just becoming normalized, at least in that realm. So it gives me hope for movies too. But yeah, and I think overall television, it's still under twenty five percent, and which is like it's like twenty seven or something. It's compared close, to but yes. features, but yeah. it's still it's like still a ways pretty to go. far away from. It's parody. true, but it's as soon as it, it's just not going to become a, a weird outlying thing. Like oh, it's a woman on set. It's just going to be you're just a director, you know. Um, so I'm, I'm looking yeah, forward teach, to that day. The Directors Guild has been incredible about oversight and just kind of shaming networks and just yeah, and keeping report helped. cards going out and saying, oh, CBS, you did great, but unfortunately, NBC and ABC are beating you now, so, and just kind of getting them, yeah. you know, we, we talk like about FX that a lot at the a Guild. FX is example of, they've done a real um, a makeover uh, with a lot more women-led and women-run shows. It's been, yeah, it's nice to see some people listening, <laughs> some people being shamed. Have you Have either of you experienced a glass ceiling? Uh, I feel incredibly lucky that I have really not. Um, I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that my first three films really were, the first one was a nonprofit film studio. It was a ridiculously lucky situation where I was basically commissioned to write and direct my first feature by a local um, nonprofit studio in Seattle that was very short-lived. And then my second two features, I produced myself. And I had been an experimental filmmaker before, so I was very comfortable with fundraising from like philanthropic means. And I sort of did fundraising parties, and I got fiscal sponsorship, and I kind of like you would a doc. You know, I, I got a, grants and things like that. So I... I did not, I wasn't, I didn't know anything about the investor model and I, I didn't ha was, I didn't know about a business plan. I didn't know about that. But it, they were such low budgets that I was able to pass the hat basically <laughs> and make those movies. And so it was completely on my own terms, you know, and, and because the budgets were so low, the stakes were so low that if they'd been failures, I could have just swept them under the rug and nobody would have been the wiser, you know, and it wouldn't have put a bl black mark on me. So it, I really recommend that for people, you know, who want to start because you really have no excuse with the, the level of um, quality that you can get in equipment now and the way you can, you know, edit on your laptop. I mean, you really can just start making, find your tribe, start making stuff. And then it was the third film getting into Sundance that kind of made it be so I could have a career. Yeah, it's same, same. Basically, I mean, I, I did a lot of stuff that's almost everything's been very self-generated. So, um, but I would say also that there's a lot of sort of insidious, less obvious. Uh, it's not exactly like the the blunt, you know, glass ceiling feeling where you just somebody's like, you can't do this because you're a woman, or like, I'm not going to hire you because you're a woman. There's a lot of uh, sort of more subtle uh, moments that go by on any set or any, you know, meeting room where you don't, you don't, you, there's might be something, you know, fueling a certain line of questioning, a certain level of distrust that you can pull off action or, or thriller or whatever. There's this, that level. Of, I just had a great um, meeting about a, a sort of an action driven uh, feature and even after this beautiful meeting where I had all these notes for the script and they were really on board with everything. They were like, and I just did this television episode that was all fighting and fight scenes and it was really great. Check it out, it's a room 104 with these two um, women boxers. Or kick Mixed martial arts. Martial yeah. arts, oh my God, it's incredible. But anyway, like even with all that, they're like, it's still it's a hard sell with a female in the fight scenes and all this like action stuff. I'm like, I don't know what I have to do. It's like they want me to put together a, a sizzle reel with things from other people's movies and I don't understand how that proves I can do it better than what I already did. <laughs> I know how to show violence. <laughs> I can curate violence, therefore I can shoot it. Um, that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The other thing I've been talking a lot about, I'm really good friends with Kim Pierce um, who did Boys Don't Cry and we were talking about our different directing styles and talking about <laughs> how to be as a woman in, in the director position on set 
in a way that's not going to threaten people or make them, you know, make them comfortable with you in authority. It's very, very interesting, you know, to sort of figure out how, you know, like I feel like women are not given the same permission to just be, you know, just kind of be assholes, honestly, on set, you know, the or way be that... eccentric. <laughs> or be eccentric, or be, yeah, guys are like, oh, you're an art, you're an auteur, you're an artiste, you can, you can, you know, work people to death, or do what, you know, and, and just kind of not know anybody's name, and just drive forward, or whatever. Women, I don't think, are given that same leeway, you know. I think there's yet, also anyway. a sensitivity to us, uh, generally, you know, where we are naturally somewhat paternal, too, and, and it actually feeds, that's why I'm always amazed that there's this, oh, it's a woman director. Like, yeah. I mean, we are, we're all about emotion and we're all about understanding the layers of life and we can hear five conversations at once. And, you know, but I did hear, and I think it's a really good tip. Somebody was saying that they, I think it was in half the picture of the documentary, that she gave direction to somebody and they totally ignored it. And then rather than take the person out offset and say, hey, you need to start listening to what I'm saying, she actually just called it right there and just said, right in front of everybody and said, when I say these things, this has happened three times now, we have to get this thing done. You need to listen to what I'm saying. I am the director, you know? And to do it That's in awesome. front of everybody, yeah, which is really, I mean, it is, it, 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 it's, I don't know, it pushes us a little bit out of our comfort zones probably, but. Yeah. I know, exactly, because we've all been, we've been enculturated is that a word? Um, you know, we've been, <laughs> we've been raised in this culture to behave, to think that we only have certain ways, you know, a certain box within which we're, we're supposed to behave as females, too. So it's just been very interesting to examine my own tendencies towards, you know, people pleasing, for instance. Like, I just, I want to know everybody's name on set and I want to, I want everybody to like me. You know, is this a part of, and it's a personality thing, too, but I think a lot of it is being female in the culture. Those things happen to serve me, you know, I think on set because people like, you want to help out and, you know, but as I also am very decisive and I'm confident and I have all these other qualities that are directorial, but um, yeah, it's been, it's just been very, very interesting to get a sense of everybody's different styles and realize that, you know, some are allowed <laughs> for women and some are not. Yeah. Well, this is all going to change and that's why we're at here. And uh, if you want to tweet about this or talk about this, we're at We Talk Culture and hashtag We Talk and if you hashtag Dell Technologies as well. That would be good. Um, I want to end your session by just saying that I think it's really wonderful that you two have collaborated in writing uh, P.I. Moms, which is named after the, the yeah, I have it right, yeah. Uh, it's named after that This American Life episode by the same name, and you're going to direct it, I believe, and you sold the pitch. Is that right? Uh, no, up? not yet. It's okay. still in development, but um, but we, I mean, we were paid to write it, um, and yeah, it it, uh, it we should. I just feel like we should mention that we've known each other for a really long time. Megan was actually my AD on my very first feature, which is how we met, and I had never. I'd been on the post side of things. Um, I edited features, but I'd never really been on set before. So she was like my my spiritual guide through that entire experience. And I became very bonded to her. And then when she started to want to go off and make her own movies, I was like, really? You're just going to abandon me? But um, we've, un unfortunately, we've remained very close and, and always, I feel like I'm the the first time I have a rough cut of something, I want to run to her and show it to her. And Same. it's been really nice. Yeah, and we have been able to collaborate on that. We also collaborated on another, on an HBO pilot that, that we sold together um, that they didn't end up green lighting, but we had a great time writing together. It was really fun. So, yeah. Maybe someday. Yeah, maybe I'll someday. do it. It's a good show. Oh, it's just lovely, <laughs> lovely to have both of you on. And thank you both so much for, for sharing your insights with us today and your films with us. And thank you so thank much. Thank you for having us. Continue to have a wonderful festival. Thank you. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it.